Got blind land speed record and Pete agreed as a national rally driving instructor he would teach me to do it. At that time I was still working for Barclays Bank as a mortgage specialist and they released me on secondment to work at Guide Dogs for the Blind as a project manager. So initially we wanted to do the project in a Jaguar. So I wrote to Jaguar in Coventry and they agreed to turn up at Bruntingthorpe, at Bruntingthorpe in Leicestershire with two Jags. No, not him because he was far too busy. <laughs> He was actually out trying to find Blunkett's dog at the time, I think. But they turned up with an XJR and an XJ220. And they said to us, if you can prove to us that you can drive the XJR safely, we'll let you loose in this XJ220, because that's what we're going to do the project in. So we were testing in the XJR, and Central TV were there. And they said after about half an hour, oh, do you mind if we get in the back of the car with you, Steve? I said, no, certainly not. So anyway, they get in the back of the car, and at 80 miles an hour, they still thought it was funny, like kids in the playground. 120 miles an hour, they're still pranking around. 140 miles an hour, it was a bit quieter. 160 miles an hour, you could have heard a mouse fart. <laughs> anyway, we pulls up, and they all pile out in the back of the car. One was green, apparently. One was white, and one disappeared. And Tony Maycock came up to me afterwards, and he said, Steve, he said, I must be mad. I said, why? He said, I've just been driven at 160 miles an hour by a blind man. I said, well, how was it for you, Tony? He said, I don't know, I had my eyes shut. <laughs> I said, well, at least we have something in common then. <laughs> but unfortunately, they wouldn't allow us to keep the car to do promotional work around the UK with. So I wrote to Chrysler. And Chrysler not only came up with a V10 Dodge Viper, but they also came up with Justin Bell, who was the world record holder in that class of car. Justin's time over a measured mile was 23.8 second, uh, seconds, and mine was 24.2 seconds. That project generated over five and a half million pounds worth of media coverage, and the beneficiaries that year were guide dogs for the blind. I went back to Barclays Bank. <clears throat> I went back to Barclays Bank, who also had had five and a half million pounds worth of media coverage, only to, only to find that they'd made me redundant. So it was a case of, what do you do? You focus on the important things in your life, you focus on the change that you can make in your life. And my opportunity, and it was an opportunity, was to set up Blind Vision, which is the company. Blind Vision was set up to run the World Blind Land Speed Challenge. It was now going to run the World Offshore Powerboat Challenge and the flight project. Why did I do a boat project when I don't like the sea? Because it was a case of me challenging myself and overcoming my fears. So we got the V24 bat boat. It was slightly different in the boat in that I got vibrating pads on the, boat, on the back of both hands. So if I was going across the water in a straight line, there was no vibrations whatsoever. If I went slightly right, there was a vibration in my left hand. If I went slightly left, there was a vibration in my right hand. It was an absolutely fantastic bit of kit, but it didn't tell you whether there's a boat or a pier in your way. <laughs> Hence the reason I needed somebody in the boat with me at all times to keep lookout. That project generated over 12.5 million pounds worth of media coverage. And the beneficiaries that year were guide dogs, dogs for the disabled, and blind children. But my ultimate challenge... <laughs> my ultimate challenge to complete the hat-trick challenge was to fly an aeroplane around the UK. We'd got sponsors lined up to do the project in September 2001. But as a result of what happened at 9-11 that year, we thought it totally inappropriate to do such a challenge. So we cancelled it for a few years and we did it in July 2004. It was a five-day project, and day one was Biggin Hill to Newcastle. Day two was Newcastle to Glasgow. Day three was Glasgow to, to, Card Glasgow to Belfast. Day four was Belfast to Cardiff, and day five was Cardiff back to London. That project generated over 17 and a half million pounds worth of media coverage. Royal National Institute for the Blind and the British Deaf Association were the beneficiaries. The, <clears throat> in the aeroplane, I had a piece of software called a voice-activated interface, which converted all the data off the control panel into speech. So it would, it would tell me everything that a sighted pilot could see. It would tell me about fuel, petrol, how high we were, whether the banking, whether in a, a climb or, or a descent. The difficulty I had was that I had to digest the information that I was being given. So it's not just the information off the control panel that you're being given. You've got air traffic control talking to you. You've got all the other pilots in the sky at the same time. I've got my software and my pilot who sat next to me as well. The reason for the pilot being in the aeroplane was you can imagine the carnage that had happened if 
finally been up there on my own and the software had packed up. <laughs> You'd have needed more than bike clips, I can tell you. <laughs> it was a fantastic project, but the projects themselves, they're not about setting world records. It's nothing to do with breaking records. It's about breaking barriers. It's about challenging yourself and living your dream. And my dream was that I wanted to drive initially. But having been made redundant by Bar Barclays, it then gave me the opportunity to set the company up. So Blind Visions not only run, run the World Blind Land Speed Challenge, the Power Boat Challenge and the Flight Project, we now, it's now developed to the degree that we go all over the world doing motivational speaking and after dinner speaking. We do business training, we do business coaching, there's, there's disability awareness training, there's disability audits, and I go all around the UK working in schools on a project called Ambition and Aspiration that myself and Sarah put together. And that's a very, very fruitful project. It's a very rewarding project because, you know, the kids are actually working towards an ambition. So when they actually leave school, they know what they're doing. They're focused, they're structured, and away they go. They're not on some register for drugs, crime, or drink. Who'd have thought it? At the age of 12, lying in my bed, feeling sorry for myself, in absolute bits, shattered emotionally and mentally. Just think, picture yourself, you're, you're, there, you're me, lay in bed, and there's this doctor at the foot of the bed, he says to you, right Steve, he said, you're going you're gonna to go blind, you know that. You're going to go and get a business degree, you're going to get married, you're going to have two adorable daughters, you're going to work for Barclays Bank as a mortgage specialist, you're going to set three world records, you're going to run your own company, and you'd have turned around to him and said, you're bloody mad. <laughs> but, <laughs> it's all about recognising your potential. It's all about listening to the information, the guidance, the support, the encouragement that you're given. Because, you know, you can do whatever you want in your life. But it's not always down to you. Sometimes, we all need help. We all need to mix together. We all need to be part of a real, really proactive and energy-focused team. And I think if we are, fear, what's that? <laughs> what is it? It's a barrier, isn't it? But it, that barrier creates the opportunity for you to overcome your fears and really live your life and do what you want to do. I do lots of work, obviously, in the charity sector. And a few years ago, I did a pres presentation down in London with Jim Davidson and John Berger. Well, at the end of the night, I think I could see further than John Virgo could. <laughs> it wouldn't matter if he'd have had about 10 pair of those glasses on that he wears. <laughs> and Jim came on stage afterwards, and he put his arm around me, and he said, Steve, he said, what you've achieved in your life is truly remarkable. He said, you've got all these world records. You're a sponsor's dream with all the media exposure. The charities love you to bits. He said, you're a credit to society, mate. I said, oh, thank you, Jim. He said, well, now you look at me. He said, I've been bankrupt twice, divorced three times, done for drink driving at least three or four times. I tell crap jokes, people laugh and come and pay thousands of pounds to see me. He said, well, I tell you what. I said, what's that, Jim? He said, I don't know, I feel sorry for your dog, listen to that shit every night. <laughs> <laughs> and I think my point is, I think my point is, when you think you're there, there's always somebody going to come, come and knock you off your perch. But I'll finish with a phrase that I use all the time, and it's go mad. Now, people think I've gone mad, or must have gone mad, to drive cars at 200 miles an hour and not be able to see. You know, do powerboats at land speeds of 225 miles an hour and not be able to see. Fly an aeroplane around the UK and not be able to see. But it actually means go make a difference. All I want from you people in 2009 is to challenge those barriers, go mad, and make this the biggest year of your lives. Thanks very much for your time.